It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Z Garcia. Hey everybody, today I'm taking a look at Fan and Mallet, a little tug of war style card game for just two players with a very strange theme. The game is, if I'm not mistaken, a Japanese design. And in it, you are ghostly apparitions, something of the sort, traveling around these different uh, villages, uh, exerting your influence in those places, hoping to win them over to your side. Uh, that's about as close as I can get thematically because it's sort of bizarre. Let me give you a look at how the game works, and then we'll come on back and I'll tell you what I thought of it. So here's what the game looks like set up ready to begin. We have laid out the villages around the outside and each player is going to be playing cards attempting to get rid of these tokens. As soon as someone has placed them all out, they are going to win the game, all right? And you are going to shuffle up your own deck. This is my deck here, my opponent's deck there. And you are going to draw six cards. The cards, most of them are going to have a color. They're going to have some bizarre illustration and they are going to have a value in the corner like so. And so as you can see here, red, four is that card. So I am going to be on my turn playing a card out and then drawing a card to replace it, possibly triggering a scoring if, a, if wherever I added a card, that is the fifth card played. Uh, the pawns here that represent us, our incarnations, are going to be moving around clockwise, dropping off cards but you don't always play in the very next village. And let me explain that in just one second. Let's say, for example, I'm the star player. I want to play one of these cards and I'm going to play the blue four here. I check after my incantation, which is the first place that can have a blue four, a blue card rather, and I add it there. In this case, this one here has no blue added yet. So I can play the blue four there and I'll move on to the place where I have just laid a card. However, if instead of playing that card, I wanted to play this red four, well, this card already has red. I cannot add red there, so it skips that, and it goes to the next place that can have red, and I jump all the way to that card. And then I would draw a replacement, and it would be my opponent's turn to play. And again, they're starting at the opposite corner, also going clockwise. So they are going to play, let's say, a yellow four right here, and they'll move to that card, and they'll draw a replacement and it comes back to me. This is going to continue happening until someone plays the fifth card at a location. So let's just accelerate the game and see how that would play out, all right? So I'm gonna just grab my opponent's hand here. Let's say they played uh, that there. Then I came back around and I added this card. And then uh, they came back around and they added, um, let's say that card, perfect. And then I skipped it and then they came back around yet again and they added another one that has to be a color that is not there. So let's say, uh, let's see, this one. They added this card here, okay? As soon as they did that, and they would be the one to play that card, I'm somewhere over here, then we are going to check who wins and you simply add up the totals. They have three, four, five, six, seven, two my six. They score this card and they add a token to that card unless it's the very first village that gets scored, in which case you add two tokens to that one. If there was a tie, let's say I had six and they had six, then you check the village itself and it will be favorable to one of the two players. In this case, it would have been favorable to me. So if, it, if we were tied, I would be the one to drop off one or two tokens if it's first, okay? And that's it. Besides that, very simple play. There's a couple of little twists which come in the form of these little ghostly uh, uh, apparitions, which are these cards here. Each player has a few and they are worth one strength, but they have some text that might modify that strength, okay? And they are, let's find them and I'll explain what it is they do. So we have here, the blue one in this deck says that you get to add the power of the absent spirit object that is highest. And so in this case, let's say um, I'm going to replace this with that. And uh, yeah, 
Let's get rid of this one just to make our example a little bit better here. And we are going to add a different red card to that. Uh, there we go. Okay, so let's say this is what it is. And that blue card at the power of the absent spirit card means that you check from four on down and whichever one is the first value that's missing, you add that much. Since there's no four here, this apparition, this uh, card is going to be worth the one plus four. It itself will, will be worth five strength. If there was a four, you check if there's any threes. If there's no threes, well, it gets added three to it and so on. So that's one of them. The other ones, like this one here in green, this one says you add the number of connected spirit cards, uh, spirit objects rather, which are the, uh, the other kind of card. And so every card after this and every card be before it that was of this kind adds one to the total here. Uh, we've got this one that says you add the power of the immediately preceding spirit object. And so if I play this on top of a four, great, that's, you know, quite powerful now. And there's a couple of other different ones. You add, um, see if I spot any others here. That one's the same. Add the number of odd followers. Um, there's one that says if, you, if the factions have alternated in the five cards that were played, you add four to it. So this one's pretty tricky. You've got to be careful. You manipulate that just right so that you and the other player alternate playing cards at that location. But that's it. That should give you a pretty decent idea of how the game works. Obviously, at the very beginning of the game, you move quite slowly around the circle. It feels like you'll never catch your opponent. But then once you sort of come back around, and once some cards have built up, it's, it's interesting and very tricky to manipulate what you play in order to skip places and jump way far ahead and place a card wherever you want to play it. And then every now and then you also run into a situation where I'm here, I want to play a card there, and the color allows me to skip all of these, but then it would get caught by this card, which is, ah, no good, I want it to play here. So you run into that kind of, of moment. So that's, that's a pretty good idea. Let's go back up top, let me tell you what I thought of it. All right, so there we go. Let's take a look at the game using our patented target audience system. Here I go. Thematic ties. Thematic ties for the game. Look, I have no idea what this game's about. I mean, I kind of get it. It's about there's those, like, you know, items imbued with life, and you have the ghost, ghost children wandering around the woods or something. It's a funky theme. It's an interesting theme. You know, it's sort of bizarre. Uh, but it, it doesn't necessarily feel particularly thematic. I am playing cards with numbers, right? Like, why is the bucket filled with water and with legs one, and the weird broom with legs is three or whatever? You know, it's, it's random, right? But is it, a, is it an interesting theme? Yeah, it's not so outside the box that I would say, oh, man, get this one just for the theme. It's so out there. But it's, it, it's all right, you know, I don't think I would, I wouldn't keep this game if I didn't like it for the theme. But it also doesn't bother me while I'm playing. Aesthetics. Again, this category is quite, um, it's a tough one to settle on in for this game because the aesthetics are neat. All the cards look like they belong in the same universe, right? They are well drawn, they're bizarre, they're quirky, they're interesting. But I could definitely see how some people would think they're just kind of creepy and, and weird. And so for me, and this is what you get when you watch my review, I like it. I think it's bizarre and I, 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 I enjoy the look of the game. And again, I'm a big stickler for all the artwork in a game either coming from the same artist or looking like it comes from the same artist. And in this one, it does. So that works for me. And once again, not a, and you know, wow, the artwork in this game is phenomenal. But it's good. And it's... Um, it's just sort of strange enough to be appealing, you know. Replayability here, it's pretty good. It, it's surprisingly good. The game has a strange uh, vibe to it that after the first time you play, you are going to be thinking, huh, I could see how I want to hang on to some cards for later in the, in the game, for like the second half of the game, you know, and then knowing when to play which little ghost card when is also very tricky, right? Like the one where you alternate cards and it gives you a, a four point boost. Yeah, that's great. And playing that early probably lets you play it where you wanna play it. But your opponent can mess that up for you. If you wait too long, that color might already have been played where you wanted to play it. And so there's that give and take there. 
So replayability here is pretty good. It, it's got a nice vibe to it. I don't think it's going to be uh, replayable forever, but I could certainly see you exploring this one for a while, especially if you play with someone new. If you play with the same person, you'll both be discovering some of those things at the same time. Once you take this to a new player, they'll be discovering some of those things, and the way they play is going to mess with your ideas and your, um, you know, your play style. So not bad on the replayability. Game length. Game length is pretty good. Um, it's not a long game, certainly, but it does feel like at the, like the first, say, third of the game does feel a little slow because you're usually not skipping places. You are just sort of play a card, go, play a card, go, and your opponent's doing the same thing around the other side, and it feels like, well, for us to get to five cards at a location is going to take a while, you know. Usually this kind of game, you play a card anywhere you want. Let's say you're pulling four or five different places, you know, tug of war style. You can sort of load up a place pretty quickly. In this one, no place is going to score for a while till about halfway through the game, you'll be hitting the first one because you do that loop and finally you'll get to five cards somewhere. So there is that a little bit. The game length feels strangely elastic at the beginning and then tightens up. It's not long but it does have that quirkiness to it. Ease of play, pretty good, really good. I mean, the game looks way more weird and complicated than it is. This is a pretty straightforward design. So I think you're gonna be able to play this one with a lot of different people. As long as, as, long as you both understand how the little ghost kids work. That's the only thing that's a little bit tricky, so make sure you double check a manual for that. The writing on the cards is not completely explicit. So, so figure out exactly what they mean by what they wrote on those cards. But other than that, it's numbers and adding them up. That's pretty much it, and I like that very much. And then finally, tactics and strategy. It's a largely tactical game, really. The strategy here, maybe holding onto a high card to be able to swing something the other way, that's not much of a strategy. It's sort of obvious. And you don't have to pick anything early, which is what I think strategic moves are. You react to your opponent, and you look for opportunities to be sneaky, to, to you know, suddenly jump way ahead when they weren't expecting it and slap down a card that wins it for you. So it's there. The tactics are neat. They're interesting, not revolutionary. Once you've played the game three, four times, the tactics have sort of settled in and you know how to play well. And at that point, you are going to be hoping you draw the right card at the right time. So a little bit of that randomness is also going to rear its head into the game. But overall, nicely done. And so, yeah, I enjoy this one. It's not one I was necessarily expecting to, to even understand, honestly, because it seems so weird. But once I figured out how it worked, once I've played, I like it. It's, it's a neat one. Interesting tug-of-war style game. So, yeah, check this one out if you can find them. This one's going to get a seal of approval from me. Uh, that is Fan and Mallet. Look into it, folks. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.